Hey, and welcome back to uh, our, our series of videos on uh, model evaluation. Um, in this video, we're going to focus specifically on the additional checks that you do when you're um, evaluating a statistical model. Um, and so this builds on you know, what I was talking about in the last few videos, which were just more, more in general when you assess uh, a model, what do you do? Uh, and in, in particular, when you're thinking about ass assessing a statistical model, it fundamentally boils down to you made some set of assumptions when you wrote down that model. That you need to test uh, in the val validity of those additional assumptions that were related to the statistical side, you know, largely things like the probability distribution, uh, to understand whether the assumptions you made were founded or not. So, um, like with basic modeling, uh, you know, the thing that we often will start with is going to be our predicted observed plot. Um, and so here is, if you remember back to our regression uh, video, um, we were trying to uh, predict soil temperature and using a set of covariates such as uh, air temperature and vapor pressure deficit and uh, uh, solar radiation and things like that. Um, and so here we're looking at a predicted observed. I've added the one to one line. Um, and uh, you know, we're seeing that it's it's not doing horrible. I mean the, the data is scattered around the one to one, it's there's no obvious bias. Uh, and also to oh, I'll, one thing I'll do in this lecture is talk about some of the R functions that I use to do this specifically. So uh, there's a predict function in R uh, that will give you back, if you put it in a regression object. Uh, it will give you back the predictions associated with uh, the, the data that was originally put in in the same order as the data that was originally put in. So if you put us in a set of X data and Y data and you make a prediction, you'll get back in a set of X, you know, predicted, X, uh, predicted Y values uh, matching those uh, observed Y values and the X that went in. Uh, cool, and so you can just you know, predict, you know, plot Y versus the prediction from your residual of y. Uh, we're still going to want to do all the sort of other visualizations that we did uh, bef before. So that might be you know, a time series plot or you know, plots of inputs versus outputs and things like that. Um, we're going to want to pay, pay, take a, a close attention to thinking about the residuals of the model and the, how uh, the residuals, how the patterns in the residuals tell us about some of the statistical assumptions we had. So in a linear model, you know, we had a couple key assumptions. One was that uh, there was uh, constant variance. Another was that the, the errors were normally distributed. And you know, another is that there was no patterns in the residuals. So looking at the residuals will help us understand uh, those, um, those assumptions. And, and that's related specifically uh, to some of the statistical assumptions that went into fitting the model. Um, and then we're going to also want to uh, look at not just uh, the predictions of the mean, uh, but with a statistical model, you also get a confidence interval and a predictive interval. So you also want to look at uh, the uncertainty coming from the model itself. Okay, so here's the, the predicted versus observed for this time point. So let's next look at, uh, since this was you know, actually a time series of soil temperature data. We looked at the, the uh, observed data uh, at the very beginning of uh, the previous lecture. Uh, and here's what we see in terms of the, the predicted versus the observed. Um, and so a couple of things jump out at me in this plot. So one is that at a high level, uh, this plot of the time series of the observations versus the predictions show that, that both our, our statistical model and our observations have a clear seasonal cycle, that our model does capture uh, that seasonal cycle fairly well. Um, it does do a decent job of capturing uh, the finer time scale variability in the summer, the spring, the summer, and the fall. Uh, but you'll notice that what the model is actually failing to do is, is capture the lack of variability in the winter. So you can see in this winter period, the soil temperatures are consistently low in the observations, but the model's making predictions that are bouncing up and down all over the place. So the, the model's actually uh, 
has a systematic error in the winter, which we'll get dive further into diagnosing as we kind of look uh, at some more detail. <clears throat> One of the, the real workhorses of uh, testing the assumptions of a linear model uh, is, is this handy set of diagnostic panels that are generated by just taking your regression object and passing it to the function plot. So if you plot the regression object, what it does is generate a series of diagnostic plots. And I want to walk through each of these plots in detail and try to relate what it's showing you to the underlying assumptions of uh, linear regression. I also want to say that uh, when you're working with more complex models that don't have this handy feature of being able to drop the regression object in, uh, to the plot, you still can generate these plots <clears throat> uh, by hand fairly easily. Okay, so the first one, plot here is showing the uh, predicted values that's coming out of the model versus the residuals. Um, and so remember, uh, in an unbiased model, the mean of the residuals should be zero, and there shouldn't be any obvious pattern to the residuals. Uh, and so one of the things that R does to help you understand that is it throws just a smooth trend line coming from uh, a function called a LOS, which is a, a locally weighted uh, uh, regression-based smoother. Um, but it, you know, it's basically a trend line. And you know, in a, in a, in a, in a great well-fit, not in a great model, but in a model that, that uh, doesn't have any obvious trends in the residuals, that's, that trend line should be at zero. So the ideal here in this plot is for that trend line to be at zero. Uh, and so here we're seeing, even though the predicted observed plot look fairly reasonable, um, that when the temperatures, uh, when the predicted temperatures are, are below freezing, uh, the model is systematically biased. Uh, and that's, of course, that's consistent with what we saw in that time series plot, uh, which is the model seemed to be getting things wrong in the winter. Um, and we see this other kind of wing of, of bias over here, uh, conditions uh, when the model's predicting positive values, but we're not actually seeing those positive values. And then we see this other kind of middle cloud that looks pretty good. So this, this wing down here is kind of pulling the bump down then we see kind of a leveling out after that. So this is just looking at the raw residuals and looking at for the idea of there being patterned in the residuals. Uh, below it in the bottom left um, is a plot of what are called standardized residuals. And you can see in the equation on the y-axis what they're, what they're kind of doing here. Uh, so first they're standardizing them so that uh, the variance in the residuals, uh, the mean variance in the residuals is one. So essentially, uh, you know, dividing it by so by the root mean squared error, so that the standard deviation is one. Um, and then we're taking the absolute value of that, so that all of our residuals are positive. Um, and yes, yeah, we're reading. So basically, uh, what we're seeing here is uh, a plot of just the positive side of these errors. And if so, uh, this scale location plot is really aimed at understanding um, the, the assumption that the variance is constant. So we, we made the assumption in the regression model that, the, that is called the homoscedasticity assumption uh, so, which is equivalent to the, you know, which means, you know, constant variance uh, as opposed to heteroscedasticity, which is when the variance changes systematically. And so this figure, the scale location plot, ideally the trend line through here should be flat at one. If we see uh, trends in this pattern, it means that uh, there may be conditions when the, the residual error is systematically higher than is uh, represented by the root squared error, uh, 
and there can be times when the, the variability is systematically lower. Uh, and so we're seeing kind of a wiggle here associated with this kind of line of systematic error that we see in the residuals plot. Um, but we're you know, kind of seeing yeah, under cold conditions, the model is uh, more variable than, is, than the, the model's uh, recorded variance represents. Um, and then on the flip side, under you know, nice warm summertime uh, temperatures, it's actually the model is doing better than is recorded by, by that, that variance. <clears throat> cool. So again, top left is to look, helping us understand is there a pattern in the residuals? Uh, scale location in the bottom left is helping us assess whether the variance is constant uh, or not. Uh, the top top right panel, this normal QQ plot, QQ is a quantile quantile plot. Um, and what that is telling us about is that assumption of whether the residuals follow a normal distribution or not. And so what they've done here is taken into the standardized residuals. Um, so they should have unit variance and uh, sorted them in order from the, the, the most negative residual to the most positive residual. Um, and then, that, so that's kind of what the y-axis is telling us, the, the actual residual of that data point all sorted in order. And the x-axis is saying, doing the calculation of, uh, given the sample size I have, and given um, the distribution that I assumed, uh, where, what should I expect to see in terms of that residual? So, you know, simple thing would be like, you know, in a normal distribution, the median, the one halfway through, should occur at the mean and there should be no residual. Uh, and, you know, the, you know, t uh, 25th percentile, uh, you know, or I guess in a, a simpler one is uh, one standard deviation is 66% or, confidence interval. So, you know, you could figure out a, a standard deviation of uh, plus one and minus one, what quantile does that uh, correspond to in the distribution? So you're kind of cal calculating, you know, uh, you know, it, so the way I think about this, if I had 100 data points, uh, the first one should show up at the first quantile, the second one should show up at the second quantile, the third one should show up at the third quantile, and so on and so forth. Uh, so we can calculate what quantiles those observations should show up at if this is normally distributed. And then we assess whether that falls along the one-to-one -one line. So if that's close to a one-to-one -one line, um, then you're doing a good job of capturing that distribution. Uh, the things you'll often find uh, in particular are, are discrepancies in, in the tails of the distribution. And they may represent cases where uh, there's more extreme values in the tails than you expect by chance, or they may represent cases where there's less than you would expect by chance. Um, and so if we look down here, we see we're overall pretty good. The, what discrepancy we do see is in the negative tail. And in the negative tail, we're seeing uh, cases where, uh, you know, when the, when the, the theoretical quantiles predict something to be, uh, you know, two standard deviations away uh, in the negative direction, we're actually seeing more like 2.5. When it predicts it to be three standard deviation away, we're seeing something uh, closer to four. So we're seeing that in, the, in the, the negative end of this distribution, we're seeing the tail goes out farther uh, than we would expect it for a, a normal distribution. Uh, that said, this, this particular uh, set of deviations is not particularly extreme, um, not hugely, hugely worrisome, but you will see some where, um, you know, when the, when the theoretical quantiles are at like, you know, minus three, if the, the actual observed quantiles are at like minus six, minus seven, like you have some really big outliers and kind of your distribution is much fatter tailed uh, than the normal distribution. By contrast, if if, if it says, you know, at minus three, you're actually seeing standardized residuals at, you know, minus two, uh, 
it means that you know you're, you're uh, the normal distribution is is predicting fatter tails in your observings. The actual observations are more truncated uh, than than predicted. Um, and uh, R does this by default with the normal QQ plot. You can always generate this by hand for any distribution as well. Uh, and then the th last figure uh, is called a leverage plot. And what this is doing is um, it's not really testing the assumptions of regression as much as if you remember when we looked at uh, Askin's quartet, we had one graph that had a whole bunch of points at one value and then one, one value off an extreme and, and showed that, you know, the line was basically, you know, going between the one outlier point and the mean of all the other points. Um, and so that point is, would be considered one that have high leverage. So, Leverage is the idea of if I changed uh, a point, how much would it change my overall results? So if I, you know, often done by if I dropped a point, how much does it change my overall results? So it's telling you uh, high leverage points, and here it's giving you the actual row numbers. That's actually worth noting. Any numbers that show up on these plots are going to be row numbers in your data set. So this is showing you a few data points, which data points have the highest leverage in, in terms of uh, affecting uh, your overall uh, model fit. And then it's plotting that against your residual. So here are these points that have the highest leverage also have very positive residuals. Um, yeah, so, so again, it's not necessarily testing the assumptions as much as it's helping you understand like are your, is your model being affected uh, a lot by a, a specific values that might be outliers? And so the, you have you know, three points that are you know, kind of on the high end uh, of, of a large residual and having a lot of effect. Uh, maybe, not un, uh, maybe not unreasonable. I mean, the overall leverage in all of any of these is quite small. But if you see a lot of leverage, uh, that's you know you want to be you know wary of how much you know individual points are affecting your overall results. Cool. Uh, in this particular set of plots, uh, one of the things that that I would diagnose by this kind of weird diagonal line. Um, again, so the primary driver of this relationship was, again was air temperature predicting soil temperature. And uh, just out of curiosity, I, I, I flipped that and I asked the question, well, what if, if I use soil temperature to predict air temperature? And then what we actually see there is, is a, uh, a much cleaner pattern to the residuals. Because um, what we're seeing is, is uh, yeah, it's kind of this clear distinction between kind of uh, warm season values uh, where the the noise is, there's no pattern in the residuals, and you kind of have constant variance, and then this cold season uh, period uh, where you see a lot more uh, variability uh, than you would expect by chance, and uh, this kind of ultimately in this particular case you know, can be attributed back to uh, the fact that if we look at the time series. Uh, we have all this variability in the winter, uh, and the most likely cause of this is that in reality, um, there's snow in this system in the winter, and snow is insulatory, and so uh, we have uh, soil temperature values at a nice stable snow insulated value in the winter where they're not responding to the air temperature because there's insulatory soil, a snow layer between uh, the air and the soil, and and that's a feature that's not in our model. So, you know, uh, we don't have the presence of snow as a predictive variable in this model. And because we don't have the presence of snow, we're missing the fact that uh, when snow is present, uh, we have a different soil temperature than when it's absent. And, and, you know, one obvious thing that could do to improve that model would be to get data on snow, or it might be to fit a different model when snow is present than versus when snow is absent. Um, 
Uh, so this, this is showing a little bit more information about uh, that uh, quantile quantile plot and showing uh, what that plot looks like when the data is normally distributed, when it's kind of uh, going to fall along the, that one-to-one -one line, uh, what the, the QQ plot looks like when the data is right skewed. So the mean is correct, but to the right direction, um, there's you know, more data that, than expected by chance. Uh, so we see this uh, higher residuals in that right direction. Uh, than we would expect it by chance if the data is, if we have less skewed data, so a fat tail in the left direction, we get more data than expected by chance in the uh, left direction. And if we have, if the distribution is symmetric, but fat tailed, you know, it has just has more data in the tails than expected by chance, then you kind of have that, a, a little bit of that in the right direction, a little bit of that in the left direction. So again, the Q, Q plot can tell you about uh, you know, having too much, too many observations in one direction or the other or both. <clears throat> uh, and again, kind of violations of that assumption of normality. So in, in all three of these cases, you would at least consider, depending on the severity of these de deviations, you would consider using distributions other than the normal distribution. Okay. Uh, this figure has a lot of code on it uh, because uh, what I'm doing here is, is now showing uh, in detail how to uh, calculate a confidence interval uh, for a linear model. And these are going to be important because we're going to want to put confidence intervals on our models uh, in general. When you fit statistical models, you want to put a confidence interval on it. One of the things we'll get to uh, later in the course is kind of how these confidence intervals are calculated and how you can calculate them for any, any model not just a linear model where they come uh, kind of pre-packaged, uh, but I'm going to walk through all of these steps. So first, I'm going to go back to just for the sake of visualization, confidence intervals are much easier to visualize when you're only dealing with one variable. Uh, and so I'm going to go back to the univariate relationship between air temperature and soil temperature and fit the linear model between those two. So I push, put in my data, Soil temperature is a function of air temperature, fitting a linear model, and I get this regression fit object. And again, if we go back to the previous lecture, that had an R squared of about 80%, so it was all overall doing well. Uh, if I wanted to make the predicted observe plot, I just use the predict function. Uh, but here, uh, I don't want to use the predict function to make predictions to the original points. Uh, I want to draw some lines. Uh, for the confidence intervals. And specifically, so what I'm going to want to do is I'm going to want to set up a sequence of values. Uh, so this T pred is a uh, temperature sequence that I want to make predictions for. There's nothing sacred about the name T pred. It's, in this case, I'm using it because I'm trying to make predictions of temperature. Uh, I've seen folks take this class and then use T pred as the name of the prediction things when they're, you know, fitting models about, you know, frogs or, you know, uh, you know, whatever, you know, it's just make, give it a meaningful variable name. In this case, it's, it's the data that I'm going to use to input my input to my model to make predictions. Um, in fact, that's really important. This is a data frame of new input data. If I want to use to make, I mean, this doesn't have to, in this case, I'm giving it a sequence of values because I want to draw lines. But if I want to make predictions into the future, I could give you, you know, a whole time series of air temperature data for next year and use that to predict soil temperature data for next year. So whatever it is, it's, it's, a, it's a data frame of your X data that you're going to want to use to make predictions. <clears throat> a really important thing about this data frame is that the names that you're putting this data frame have to be exactly the same as the names in your model. So in this model, we had one X variable TA, and it was called TA. So in this data frame, the thing I'm using to make predictions has to have the exact same name, TA. If I had two variables like you know, TA and VPD, I'd have TA equals something, comma, VPD equals something else. That's giving me this data frame that I'm using to make predictions for. So any variable in my model has to be represented in this prediction data frame. 
again, in this case, I'm just making a, a simple sequence of numbers from minus 20 to 30 so that I can draw some lines, but it could be any date at all. Um, and if I'm making, like I said, if I'm making predictions for the future or to make predictions to do some new location in space uh, or some new conditions or some running some scenarios, that this could be anything, but it has to have the same names. Uh, next, I'm going to calculate uh, two interval estimates, one called CI for the confidence interval, and one called PI for the predictive interval. Um, and I'm going to talk later in the course a lot more about what confidence intervals and predictive intervals actually are. But the important thing to remember at this stage is that the confidence interval reflects the uncertainty about the mean of the line uh, is a reflection of the uncertainty in the parameters in the model. And so uh, the uncertainty about the slope and intercept in this model translates into uncertainty about what the right line is, um, which defines the mean. Again, the line is defining the mean. So the constant interval is only propagating the parameter uncertainty. Um, Oh, so yes, I have this little arrow I just draw saying this TA has to meet that, that, meet that TA. So I'm going to now pass this set of new points to predict into the predict function. So remember, when I did the predict observe, I just put the fit in, and it makes predictions for the existing points. If I take the predict function and give it the fit object and then a new set of data, it will make predictions to that new set of data. And if I just put the fit and the t pred in, it's going to make predictions to the mean of that data. And then if I say interval equals confidence, it will give me back both the mean predictions and also the upper and lower confidence interval that reflects, again, uncertainty about parameters. Uh, so I use predict, pass it in the regression object, pass it in the data frame that I want to make predictions for tell it that I want the confidence interval, and it will give me back a new a, a matrix of data that has the, the mean, the upper and lower confidence interval. And here, I'm just going to coerce that to being a data frame. So this add, as data frame is just coercing that matrix into a data frame so, so that I can call those columns by name. <clears throat> and then I'm going to do the same thing with a prediction interval. And the predictive interval now includes both that parameter uncertainty uh, as well as uh, the residual uncertainty. So this is accounting for the uncertainty in the parameters and the uncertainty in the residuals. Um, so it's kind of adding in the error from the root mean squared error. And I'm doing that using the exact same syntax, except now I'm saying the interval is the prediction. So it's going to give me back three things, the mean, the upper confidence interval, and the lower confidence interval. OK, so this is all the calculations I need to do. I fit the model, I set up the data frame to make predictions, I calculate my confidence interval, and maybe the predict predictive interval. The rest of this is just plotting it up. Um, so again, I have a plot function, uh, just using base graphics here, air temperature on the x, soil temperature on the y, some labels. I made the character small on this so that it, since I have a lot of data, uh, I'm using uh, the AB line function, I talked about this in the regression lecture, the AB line function, if you pass it a regression object, will draw uh, the regression line. I made setting color equals to two to make that red, I'm setting line width equal four to make it a nice thick line. Uh, the next two lines are drawing the constant interval. So within the constant interval object, there's a column LWR for the lower constant interval and UPR for the upper confidence interval. Uh, and these are calculated at matching these specific data points in the predictive data set. So I'm using the predicted, the, the air temperature that I want to use to make predictions, and the lower confidence interval, and then the upper confidence interval. I'm again drawing these in red, and I'm setting the line type two to make them dashed. Uh, you may look at this and say, okay, where are the red dashed lines? And they're really subtle in this particular plot. If you look at the high end, you know, up here by 30, you can kind of see the hint uh, of on the red line of these dashed lines. And in this particular case, because we had thousands and thousands of data points, 
Uh, there's very little uncertainty about the slope and intercept, and therefore the Compton interval, which again only represents the parameter uncertainty, is very, very tight around the mean. So we're very confident about, so under the assumption that this is a straight line, so conditional on a particular model structure, we're very confident about the parameters, and so we're very confident about what the best line is. Uh, next, we draw the predictive interval the exact same way as we did the, the comps interval. Now I'm setting that color to four, which gives me a blue line. And now that's showing uh, what I would predict for new observations. And it's accounting for the fact that the model doesn't explain all the variability in the data. And so at any particular point, you know, at, say it at uh, when the air temperature is 10, I would predict the soil temperature uh, to have a mean of about 10, uh, but it, 95% of the time, it could easily be between uh, 5 degrees and 15 degrees Celsius when I'm predicting the mean to be 5. And because that's just in the past, when I calibrated the data, that's what I saw. That's the amount of variability I saw around this model. Cool. And so, yeah, so that's really helpful. Uh, again, I'll, I'll encourage that to become the norm when you're fitting regression models is to put these constant upper and lower constant intervals. Uh, around this, and also just a reminder, because this will come up in, in labs as well, uh, that if you want to make predictions under different scenarios or different future conditions, or, or you know, if you have some new, ver new data that you want to plug into this model, that comes back to the data frame that you're passing in as the second argument to predict. And again, that those names have to match exactly. Likewise, here's another simple but common error. Uh, if I had written LM equals, you know, dat dollar sign TS2 tilde dat dollar sign TA, then this variable name has to be dat dollar sign TA, not just TA. Again, an argument for passing the data frame by name into an LM, because that's a really awful variable name, dat dollar sign TA. Uh, but it has to be, you know, an exact character by character match between the variable names. That's a very common error. Cool. Uh, so that's going to wrap up kind of this discussion, this overall discussion on, on model diagnostics. Again, starting from models in general and then finishing up in this lecture, thinking specifically about uh, uh, regression models and how we test the assumptions of regression models. Thanks.